Excerpt from The Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum Even with eyes protected by the green spectacles, Dorothy and her friends were at first dazzled by the brilliancy of the wonderful city. The streets were lined with beautiful houses, all built of green marble and studded everywhere with sparkling emeralds. They walked over a pavement of the same green marble, and where the blocks were joined together were rows of emeralds set closely and glittering in the brightness of the sun. The window panes were of green glass, even the sky above the city had a green tint, and the rays of the sun were green. There were many people, men, women, and children, walking about, and these were all dressed in green clothes and had greenish skins. They looked at Dorothy and her strangely assorted company with wondering eyes, and the children all ran away and hid behind their mothers when they saw the lion, but no one spoke to them. Many shops stood in the street, and Dorothy saw that everything in them was green. Green candy, green popcorn were offered for sale, as well as green shoes, green hats, and green clothes of all sorts. At one place, a man was selling green lemonade, and when the children brought it, Dorothy could see that they paid for it with green pennies. There seemed to be no horses nor animals of any kind. The men carried things around in little green carts, which they pushed before them. Everyone seemed happy and contented and prosperous. The guardian of the gates led them through the streets until they came to a big building, exactly in the middle of the city, which was the Palace of Oz, the Great Wizard. There was a soldier before the door, dressed in a green uniform and wearing a long green beard. Here are strangers, said the guardian of the gates to him, and they demand to see the Great Oz. Step inside, answered the soldier, and I will carry your message to him. So they passed through the palace gates and were led into a big room with a green carpet and lovely green furniture set with emeralds. The soldier made them all wipe their feet upon a green mat before entering this room. And when they were seated, he said politely, Please make yourselves comfortable while I go to the door of the throne room and tell Oz you are here. They had to wait a long time before the soldier returned. When at last he came back, Dorothy asked, Have you seen Oz? Oh, no, returned the soldier. I have never seen him. But I spoke to him as he sat behind his screen and gave him your message. He said he will grant you an audience if you so desire. But each of you must enter his presence alone, and he will admit but one each day. Therefore, as you must remain in the palace for several days, I will have you shown to rooms where you may rest in comfort after your journey. Thank you, replied the girl. That is very kind of Oz. The soldier now blew upon a green whistle, and at once a young girl, dressed in a pretty green silk gown, entered the room. She had lovely green hair and green eyes, and she bowed low before Dorothy as she said, Follow me, and I will show you to your room. So Dorothy said goodbye to all her friends except Toto and taking the dog in her arms, followed the green girl through seven passages and up three flights of stairs, until they came to a room at the front of the palace. It was the sweetest little room in the world, with a soft, comfortable bed that had sheets of green silk and a green velvet counterpane. There was a tiny fountain in the middle of the room that shot a spray of green perfume into the air to fall back into a beautifully carved green marble basin. Beautiful green flowers stood in the windows, and there was a shelf with a row of little green books. When Dorothy had time to open these books, she found them full of queer green pictures that made her laugh. They were so funny. In a wardrobe were many green dresses, made of silk and satin and velvet, and all of them fitted Dorothy exactly. Make yourself perfectly at home, said the green girl, and if you wish for anything, ring the bell. Oz will send for you tomorrow morning. She left Dorothy alone and went back to the others. These she also led to rooms, and each one of them found himself lodged in a very pleasant part of the palace. Of course, this politeness was wasted on the scarecrow, for when he found himself alone in his room, he stood stupidly in one spot, just within the doorway, to wait till morning. It would not rest him to lie down, and he could not close his eyes, so he remained all night staring at a little spider, which was weaving its web in a corner of the room just as if it were not one of the most wonderful rooms in the world. The tin woodman lay down on his bed from force of habit, for he remembered when he was made of flesh. But not being able to sleep, he passed the night moving his joints up and down to make sure they kept in good working order. The lion would have preferred a bed of dried leaves in the forest, and did not like being shut up in a room. 
but he had too much sense to let this worry him, so he sprang upon the bed and rolled himself up like a cat and purred himself asleep in a minute. The next morning after breakfast, the green maiden came to fetch Dorothy, and she dressed her in one of the prettiest gowns made of green brocaded satin. Dorothy put on a green silk apron and tied a green ribbon around Toto's neck, and they started for the throne room of the great Oz. First they came to a great hall, in which were many ladies and gentlemen of the court, all dressed in rich costumes. These people had nothing to do but talk to each other, but they always came to wait outside the throne room every morning, although they were never permitted to see Oz. As Dorothy entered, they looked at her curiously, and one of them whispered, Are you really going to look upon the face of Oz the Terrible? Of course, answered the girl, if he will see me. Oh, he will see you, said the soldier who had taken her message to the wizard, although he does not like to have people ask to see him. Indeed, at first he was angry and said I should send you back where you came from. Then he asked me what you look like, and when I mentioned your silver shoes, he was very much interested. At last I told him about the mark upon your forehead, and he decided he would admit you to his presence. Just then, a bell rang, and the green girl said to Dorothy, that is the signal. You must go into the throne room alone. She opened a little door, and Dorothy walked boldly through and found herself in a wonderful place. It was a big round room with a high arched roof, and the walls and ceiling and floor were covered with large emeralds set closely together. In the center of the roof was a great light, as bright as the sun, which made the emeralds sparkle in a wonderful manner. But what interested Dorothy most was the big throne of green marble that stood in the middle of the room. It was shaped like a chair and sparkled with gems, as did everything else. In the center of the chair was an enormous head, without a body to support it or any arms or legs, whatever. There was no hair upon this head, but it had eyes and a nose and a mouth, and was much bigger than the head of the biggest giant. As Dorothy gazed upon this in wonder and fear, the eyes turned slowly and looked at her sharply and steadily. Then the mouth moved, and Dorothy heard a voice say, I am Oz, the great and terrible. Who are you, and why do you seek me? It was not such an awful voice as she had expected to come from the big head, so she took courage and answered, I am Dorothy, the small and meek. I have come to you for help. The eyes looked at her thoughtfully for a full minute. Then, said the voice, where did you get the silver shoes? I got them from the Wicked Witch of the East when my house fell on her and killed her, she replied. Where did you get the mark upon your forehead, continued the voice. That is where the good witch of the north kissed me when she bade me goodbye and sent me to you, said the girl. Again the eyes looked at her sharply, and they saw she was telling the truth. Then Oz asked, What do you wish me to do? Send me back to Kansas, where my Aunt Em and Uncle Henry are, she answered earnestly. I don't like your country, although it is so beautiful, and I am sure Aunt Em will be dreadfully worried over my being away so long. The eyes winked three times, and then they turned up to the ceiling and down to the floor and rolled around so queerly that they seemed to see every part of the room. And at last they looked at Dorothy again. Why should I do this for you? asked Oz. Because you are strong, and I am weak. Because you are a great wizard, and I am only a little girl.